presidente de la Real Sociedad Española de Química, el profesor Jesús Jiménez Barbero, el presidente del Comité de Organización, organizador, el profesor Fallanás, y el profesor Eduardo Rubio, que realizará luego la presentación del conferenciante. El que les habla, sobre todo para la gente de fuera, pues soy rector de la Universidad de Viedo y también soy profesor de Química Orgánica. Eh, a mí entrega la palabra el presidente del Comité Organizador, el profesor Fallenas. Gracias. Excelentísimo señor rector, señor director del Departamento de Química Orgánica y Inorgánica, señor presidente de la, de la Real Sociedad Española de Química, profesor Rubio, profesor Barbuenda, profesor Forja, señoras y señores. Quiero hacer una breve introducción en mi calidad de presidente del Comité Organizador. Hace ahora justo un año, por iniciativa del Departamento de Química Orgánica e Inorgánica, y del Instituto Universitario de Química Radiomecánica Enrique Mole, y contando con el apoyo inestimable de la Universidad de Oviedo, tuvo lugar la edición inaugural de lo que se denominamos eh, como Conferencia Barbuenda. Esta conferencia nació con el objetivo de reconocer y mantener en la memoria el inmenso legado científico que nos ha dejado el profesor Barbuenda y que ha contribuido a poner en nombre de la Universidad de Oviedo y de Asturias en los circuitos científicos internacionales. Ayer, y manteniendo el mismo formato que en la pasada edición, iniciamos los actos de esta conferencia con la celebración de un simposio que contó con la participación de un grupo selecto de los químicos más prestigiosos de nuestro país, ya que, como se comentó en esa edición, eh, pretendemos que este acto sea una referencia en el calendario científico anual de nuestro país. Tras la conferencia inaugural celebrada el año pasado y que fue impartida por el profesor Manfred Fretz, para esta nueva edición de, el Comité Científico seleccionó al profesor Peter Forja de la Universidad de California en Berkeley para impartir la conferencia de este año. La relevancia del profesor Forja en la química de los últimos 40 años así como su contribución a la excelencia en la docencia, está fuera de toda discusión y nos sentimos muy honrados de contar con su presencia. No voy a extenderme más, así que solo quiero, en nombre de todo el comité organizador, darles la bienvenida y agradecer su presencia y participación en esta edición de la Conferencia de la Reino. Muchas gracias.
Señor rector magnífico, señor director del Departamento de Química Orgánica y Inorgánica, señor presidente de la Banca de Sociedad, señor presidente del Comité Organizador, don José. ¿No se me oye? Don José, queridos compañeros y amigos. It is a real pleasure, a privilege and an honor for me to introduce you to the figure of Professor Peter Bock. Sugar is a familiar name to all organic chemists in the world as the author of his landmark textbook, The Seven Editions Up to Now, and the reference for teachers for the last quarter of a century. I remember the, the shop it represented its first edition and the change in the way of teaching organic chemistry that it fostered. But admitting its relevance, in my opinion, it is just a plus to consider, and there are many other aspects all along his scientific career that make of Peter Borchardt an outstanding figure that deserves consideration. And I would like to share with you my personal vision of some of these other aspects of his life. You might probably already know that he has a special relationship with Spain from his very first days since he was born in Madrid and spent most, most of his childhood in Argentina playing soccer in the streets as a boy. And he has spread his mastery to many Spanish chemists among whom I was honored to be one of them. From the Canary Islands to Galiz and Asturias, and many of them are present today. We had the, the opportunity to work under his teaching in the Latimer Hall at the University of Berkeley. And I must confess without hesitation that I remember those days as the best of my life. But when, when entering into his adolescence, his family moved, moved back to Germany where he completed his studies of, of chemistry at the University of Munich. And then he moved to London. We are now in 1968, the 60s in London, and Peter Bonhart has always been a passionate of life. So what I want to explain to you is that if you are in London in 1968 and you are in your 20s, you have to love and live rock and roll. <laughs> so it was at those moments where he had to take the hard decision of his life to dedicate to play the guitar in a rock and roll band or to chemistry. And even some people say that soccer even had, had its chance. <laughs> Anyway, unfortunately for us, and maybe even for rock and roll and soccer, this <laughs> is wrong on the chemistry phase. I have mentioned this episode because I think that it is import it's important to understand his further life and professional career. So he completed his PhD under the wise guidance of Professor Garrett at the University College in London, working on chemistry of phenylenes and where he had some famous to be bench lab mates, such as his friend Casey Nicolau. Once he obtained his PhD in the Green, he moved to California, where he was a postdoc with Professor Robert Bergman, then at Caltech at the first stages of his long and successful career. It is my belief that he chose California, probably motivated again for the appeal of rock and roll of places like Pasadena, LA, San Francisco. Once he finished his postdoctoral stay, he looked for a place in the US to start his independent research career. And from his own words, he received several <coughs> tempting offers and had even a revealing and illuminating interview with Robert Woodward at Harvard University. But he finally decided to accept a position of assistant professor at the University of Berkeley. And of course, he fell in love with the place as it always happens to any fortunate person that discovers the Bay Area of San Francisco. And since then, he never abandoned California. Except, of course, if we do not count his many travels all around the world, especially in the years previous to this internet era, when communication was more related to personal encounters, rather than to writing a few characters in a social network. Besides Europe, he has been an assiduous lecturer in countries such as Japan, Korea, or China, long before these countries emergence to the top of science in the world. He has always been a man of long vision, way ahead of his time. His first years as a researcher at Berkeley were a real explosion. By the way, explosion is a word that he really enjoys. You can confirm this just by watching his first lecture of introduction to organic chemistry, available on the webpage, 
and his reaction to a picture of a casino in flames in Las Vegas, not to mention his burning of the familiar home at the age of six, together with another episode I'm going to relate in a few seconds. All along his life he has been a pioneer. And if you look for it carefully, you can find him behind many of the most important developments of the moment. Just to mention a few examples, his work is considered a seminal in the application of organometallic compounds to the synthesis of natural compounds. See, for instance, his total synthesis of a strong model using his famous cobalt catalyzed 2 plus 2 plus 2 recyclization of alkynes. Also, he was very close to the blossom of new materials area in the 80s, when the, when the excitement around fullerenes or nanomaterials was taking place. And his contributions to the theoretical studies on aromaticity and phenylines are well known around the world. Moreover, he has a, had a, a long standing interest on understanding the basis of the metal metal bonds. And late in the 80s, he launched a program to approach energy related issues that again were far ahead of his time. Overall, his contributions to chemistry have been recognized over the years with the most important awards of our profession. <coughs> Bringing up just a few of the most relevant, I can remind you that he was mentioned by Science Digest as one of the most outstanding youngest chemists in America. I received the Humboldt Senior Scientist, the ACS Award in Organometallic Chemistry, the Otto Bayer Prize, the Arthur S. Scope Scholar Award, the NSF Special Creativity Award, the ACS Edward Leithy Award, together with uh, many other distinctions as lecturer or honorary doctorates in major places all around. To complete this short account, uh, it should be worth to mention also his contribution to the editorial work, and especially his launching and consolidation of the Dual Inlet in 1990, where he still continues to co collaborate at the advisory board. Should I have to describe with a few words his relationship with chemistry, I will probably pick three words. The combination of fun, rigor, and risk. He has been, all through his professional career, a passionate chemist. Probably you would better understand what I mean by listening to an interview he considered to the Student Association in Berkeley, available again at the internet, where he describes his reaction to an accidental explosion that occurred at the inorganic department during the moments where he was thinking about the studies to take. I will not uncover his reaction. Please look for it and listen it because it really pays. Or maybe I could share with you some experience with a hammer in his lab and covering the sometimes funny, very, very funny behavior of Alcanis. And a short interview here related also to fun. At my time in Berkeley, it was very easy to realize his arrival to the building several minutes before it occurred. Just by listening to the huge roar of the engine of his glamorous Ferrari, Ferrari Testa Rosa. <laughs> Once I, I asked him to let me drive it, but unfortunately he refused. <laughs> I will never forgive you about it. <laughs> well, besides fun, I have mentioned rigor. At his lab, from the very first day, we knew that things would be done in the correct manner, and that any assert we made might be perfectly and completely supported. Any proposition should be well documented and data should be added to corroborate. And he has also the same question, why do you want to do that? It's true. <laughs> why do you do that? Although evident, this is, in my opinion, the first and most important characteristic that must accompany a scientist, the real. And the last word I have picked is risk. He has <coughs> explained at this point that his profile published in Angevan a few years ago. When asked about an advice to give to new scientists, he answered, I quote, overcome your fear of flying and jump. This high risk research is disproportionately rewarded. Regarding his attitude, I have to say that Peter Bocher has been a very personal and different chemist compared with the model archetype of your professor in the extremely competitive world we live. With the pression classical archetype, I mean someone who wants in his team as many people as he can obtain, push them to work and publish as many papers as possible and became famous. I'm sure you or know many of them. But Peter Wolhard do not belong to this class. 
This driving force has always been simply the fun of learning something. I remember that he had always his door open to you to discuss about anything you wanted, but he never pushed you. He left you to do whatever you thought was interesting and welcomed and was anxious to hear your ideas and opinions. And his interventions at the group meetings were true masterclass. Few words, but always getting the key of the subject and showing you a different way of thought that you had not realized before. To combine the stress that the daily life of a leading scientist implies with having a family is an extremely difficult task. And in a moment of his life, he realized that this is also an important aspect that has not to be refused. And probably Marie, his wife, has something to say or to be blamed about it. Now, besides a hard worker, as he has always been, he also enjoys being a family man. Extremely proud of his sons, Paloma and Julian, whom you probably know because they have been used as models for the stereochemical concept of mirror image in this textbook. Well, this is it. Along these few years, I have tried to draw a sketch of my vision and the personality of Peter Walker, and I hope I have rise in you at least part of the respect and admiration I have for you. <coughs> Postdoc, which was unsuccessful. 
Uh, that you can see me here. This is when I was uh, young, single, and beautiful. <laughs> now I'm just beautiful. <laughs> and when I was here last time, it was in uh, 1993, there was a meeting uh, here, and uh, I was super excited because my wife got pregnant. So I showed this picture, actually, I don't know whether people remember this, of the uh, ultrasound of uh, what then turned into my daughter. Uh, Paloma, who is now 21, and uh, studying abroad actually this semester in uh, Buenos Aires and Santiago de Chile. Uh, and uh, three years later, my son, Julian. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, <laughs> seeing uh, the plan. Uh, this lecture I would like to dedicate to uh, Jose. Here it is. And uh, you'll be my sun god for today. Okay, harnessing sunlight. Uh, if you look at the U.S., uh, it needs about 100 quads per year of uh, uh, energy. Uh, a quad is 10 to the 18 joules. It's an unimaginably large number. If you translate it, try to picture this, if you translate this into coal, uh, if you, there are coal trains. Uh, it would be a coal train that is uh, four and a half thousand miles long. That uh, so it's almost from Berkeley to Oviedo. Uh, that it, it equals one quad. Okay? So U.S. alone needs hundred quads. Of these, eighty-six are from fossil fuels. Sixty-five are used for power production. That's electricity and transportation. Thirty-five are directly used for heating. Moreover, of the 65 here that are used for power production, 45 are lost as heat. Okay? We are the biggest energy wasters in terms of just heat dissipating into our environment, starting, of course, with our computers, which are produced heat, but everything else that produces heat is just uh, uh, lost. And so the idea is to perhaps uh, address the issue of heat, not just electricity, <coughs> using sunlight. Most work in terms of harnessing sunlight is uh, focused on photovoltaics, but it would be uh, very desirable to have some kind of a system that stores sunlight as heat that can be transported to wherever you want, particularly cold climates, and then released uh, uh, on demand. So this business of storing sunlight as heat is actually old business. It's huge business, multi-billion dollar uh, uh, setups, and here's one of them, the Island Paw Solar Power Plant in the Republic uh, Desert, which was opened last year. Uh, it's got 350,000 mirrors, so all of these things here are mirrors, and these mirrors is basically sunbathing. They focus the sunlight on these towers, there are three of them, uh, and uh, heat it up, and uh, that then is used to drive a steam engine and so forth and generate electricity. It powers a town of about 120,000 uh, uh, people. The problem with that is, for starters, it's really primitive as far as I'm concerned. There's no elegance to that. Uh, secondly, there's a problem, of course, of what you do when the sun goes down. You can't store this heat. There are all kinds of insulation systems that uh, are quite clever, uh, trying to maintain, uh, keep the heat in place, but in the end, uh, you don't have something that can be stored and transported wherever uh, you need it. Uh, so we decided to look into molecules that store uh, sunlight as heat, also uh, a problem that has been looked at quite a bit. And currently, uh, the two major efforts, one of them is biofuel, so this is mimicking nature, where you're using sunlight to turn <coughs> CO2, and, uh, well, nature uses sunlight to turn CO2 and water into carbohydrates such as glucose, a lot of energy uh, is stored this way, but this is an unbelievably inefficient uh, way. And so now there some of my <coughs> colleagues at Berkeley are developing plants that are genetically engineered that will uh, turn CO2 into octane and related molecules. But the idea is to use sunlight and some kind of biomass and generate biofuel, and then you have to have a, a whole infrastructure, of course, that delivers this biofuel in Berkeley, we have a whole bunch of biofuel uh, gas stations, and people run their cars on biofuel. 
So this is uh, important, and uh, this is for me uh, also very important because here's a picture of my car. <laughs> and I need cheap gas because the Ferrari fuel injection system consists of a shower head that sprays gasoline onto the engine to the tune of about three gallons per minute. And so we need some, some good gas. Oil. The second one is the hydrogen tank. We got actually a little more efficient and cleaner actually today where you use sunlight to split water and that makes uh, hydrogen and then you have the whole business of developing a hydrogen economy. Uh, I think feasible, but there is one big stumbling block that needs to be addressed, namely the general public, particularly the American public. They are very hesitant to drive uh, a car that basically has a bomb sitting under your behind, particularly when it's a hydrogen bomb. <laughs> so this perception has to be overcome. Okay, so here's a simple con concept. What about a single molecule that stores photonic en energy by isomerization? So uh, the isomer would have to be stable, store a sufficient amount of energy to be viable, and then you release that energy either catalytically or by warming up a little bit uh, at will, whenever you want to. And what you want is something that is recyclable. So it turns back to where it came from, and then you use light again to pump it back up. So what would have then uh, uh, what is, amounts to a sun-rechargeable thermal battery. Now this also is an old concept. In fact, there are many organic molecules that people have looked at over the last 50 years or so. But the most famous one perhaps is the Novonadine Quad Recycling System, which stores 21 kcal per mole. Uh, this thing is stable. The activation energy for going back is 38 kcal, so it's indefinitely stable uh, at room temperature and certainly at uh, uh, elevated <coughs> uh, temperatures. This itself, of course, is useless because you need UV light to do this, but people have made hundreds of derivatives with uh, light harvesting antennas, so to speak, uh, substituents that, that uh, cover the solar spectrum. Uh, particularly the Russians and then later the uh, Japanese were heavily involved in this. But this never came to even a device, a practical device, because the system is not stable enough. E even the full conversion already uh, it's quite efficient, but if you lose 5% in photoconversion, and the thermal reversal is usually uh, worse, uh, then after a few cycles, uh, uh, your material is dead. And you don't want that, of course. You know, if you want something practical, you want to be able to do this thousands of times or millions of times, back and forth, uh, in order to be practical. So we had a crazy idea uh, years ago uh, uh, to look at organometallic systems. These are very, very rare, uh, for good reason, actually. Uh, uh, well, the advantages are there's a wider structural and spectral tunability, because we have D orbitals to work with, so there's color, if you wish. Uh, the disadvantages uh, are obvious, namely many of these are unstable, they're air sensitive, often they're toxic, and often they're expensive. But I'm an academician, and I do basic research, and so, I was completely unperturbed um, by these uh, drawbacks. Uh, and so we looked at, we, we, I'm telling you about two frameworks that we looked at today. The first one is methylated phenylate, where we discovered that uh, we can uh, complex uh, uh, these phenylates, which is a class of polycyclic benzenoids that we invented, uh, uh, where we have various topologies. Here's the linear frame, which is what we looked at most. Uh, but there's an angular frame, zigzag, and triangular, and helical, and so on. All of those were made in my laboratory, by the way. Uh, and we found that, uh, particularly the linear system, the homo lumo gap is small enough that uh, comp you can complex various metals, and here uh, I'm looking at CP4. Uh, and we found that with sunlight, this thing jumps. And it jumps from an internal position to a terminal position, and it stops there, and in this way, it stores uh, sunlight as heat, because this is a high energy isomer, and then on slight warming, it goes back and releases its energy. So here's a cartoon sunlight store storage. It's locked here because it's stable, and then when you warm it, it releases heat, and there's your thermal battery. That's the concept. 
So how did uh, we get at these systems? The, this is the classical uh, synthesis of the linear uh, phenylenes. It's all alkyne cyclotrimerizations. Eduardo alluded to uh, our work on uh, alkyne cyclotrimerizations. Uh, but this is not for natural products, it is for unnatural products. And we found that we can cyclize in both directions, to the left and to the right of these molecules, and very quickly build these up. And, if you, uh, and so this is a co-cyclization with this trimethylsilylacetylene, it's this molecule here, and then you can see how 2 plus 2 plus 2 of this gives the new benzene ring on the right and the new one on the left. And if you do this under the right conditions, low enough temperature, uh, so it's not catalytic, the cobalt sticks. So this becomes a stoichiometric reaction, one equivalent, and you get uh, you know, reasonable yields of these uh, complexes. And we noticed that when we, we looked at the higher ones here, that the cobalt wound up in the middle in these cyclizations, when in fact it had a choice of being at the end. In fact, it shouldn't be at the end, because if you look at the mechanism of this cyclization, which I won't go into, uh, the cobalt, of course, you know, binds these alkynes, one, two, and the third one here, and then it does the two plus two plus two, making this ring, and therefore it should be here rather than here, uh, kinetically, uh, after the cyclization. But in both of these cases here and others, it wound up uh, on the inside. And so that, we call this the wrong position. And that already suggested that perhaps the cobalt might be shifting. So indeed, then by serendipity, actually Peter Rosa, who is now an assistant professor at the uh, University of Minnesota um, uh, uh, Medical, no, uh, pharmacy school, uh, he uh, made this linear five uh, frame, and, he, and the cobalt uh, was attached, and he tried to get rid of the cobalt because he wanted the free ligand. We wanted to do some chemistry. And one of the experiments was to formalize it in the presence of external ligands. And instead of displacing the cobalt, it just shifted. And this was very nicely seen. Notice that with, with these solid groups, they're very convenient because it makes these things soluble and more stable. Everything is singlets. So you see nice singlets in the NMR. You formalize it, a new set of singlets in the NMR shows up. And the cobalt jumped from the internal position to the terminal, and then on slide warming, it <coughs> reverted back to where it came from. Uh, the photostationary state uh, is uh, not great, uh, in part because the uh, UV spectra of these two compounds overlap, and so you get, you know, you're radiating both uh, parts and you uh, don't get full conversion. If you use a laser, you can get complete conversion. Uh, so this was very exciting because cyclobutadiene hopping was unprecedented. There's a lot of haptotropism between benzene rings and even cyclopentadienyl rings and benzene rings, but not uh, from one cyclobutadiene to the other. Uh, it also explained the location of the CP cobalt in our synthesis, and this was very rare. In fact, there were only two systems when we started this where it had been observed uh, that on thermal uh, radiation, uh, a, 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 a system rearranged for the metal shifting and on warming, it went back. Only, only two systems like this without any external other manipulation like adding ligands or uh, dissociating ligands. There's a nice review on this uh, in uh, pollination chemistry reviews. So Peter, uh, 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 Tom Grossman then followed up on this. Uh, running out of gas. Do we have a pointer? Um, followed up on this, um, uh, he is now actually starting a, 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 a professorship at the uh, Frey University in Utrecht in January. Uh, and uh, they looked at the kinetics. And, and so we did some very nice physical organic chemistry in order to find out what is going on. And so the formal isomer, when you warm it, goes back to the uh, starting uh, uh, system with the cobalt in the middle. And uh, you run kinetics, and you find that the kinetics are solvent polarity independent. I'm just showing you three cases. We ran a few of them. Uh, the activation energy is about 25, 26 uh, kilocalories uh, per mole. We also looked at the hexyl system, where R equals hexyl. 
and there we found that the, it's slow. Okay? And that was the first indication that while probing exactly how does the cobalt march up and down, it may be going through the edge via the R group, so going around the periphery rather than going through uh, the metal. There was no concentration effect on first order kinetics, so it looks like a pure intramolecular uh, reaction and added ligands have no effect. So this was general. Sander Oldenhoff, an undergrad uh, in my group who then completed his PhD in uh, <coughs> the Netherlands and is now at a forensic <coughs> institute, believe it or not. Uh, he did linear four, and when you formalize that, this cleanly then uh, converts to here, the photostation state is uh, quite a bit better, uh, just using sunlight. Okay? So we just take it to Berkeley to the balcony of the lab, and it photoisomerizes uh, very quickly. Uh, and he, did, he ran the kinetics of the thermal reversal, again, about 25, 26. In fact, all these systems have about the same activation energy, which is interesting because uh, the ground state is obviously shifting, so the ground state is in the transition state for the ship. They move up in parallel. Uh, and uh, then we, uh, after linear four, we decided to look at linear three. This one, of course, is degenerate in its shift. Uh, and so we thought maybe we could uh, detect the, uh, the uh, cyclobutadiene hopping <coughs> by NMR. If you heat this up, the two, sorry, the three singlets that you observe in starting material should coalesce into two. Uh, but even up to 120 degrees, it's too slow. Uh, and so we decided to desymmetrize the system, and here's a short picture of uh, reminding you of how we make these. These are all made from iolo arenes, Sonogashira coupling, puts into the acetylenes, uh, protect it, then you deprotect and then you cyclize. And this gives you the unsymmetrical system, and this one already <coughs> is a mixture uh, predominantly this isomer, 98 to 2, meaning that this is about 2.3 kcals per mole more stable uh, than that. And this guy crystallizes, so we actually have an X-ray structure. We're not sure why this is the major isomer. There is some indication. We have a good guess. Uh, and the, from the X-ray structures of this and the free ligand and other complexes, it appears that when the cobalt is next to this benzene ring, this cyclobutadiene ring aromatizes, uh, which means that uh, you basically uh, have some bond fixation on the adjacent benzene ring, as indicated by this resonance form, meaning that there is a pseudo single bond here, uh, which puts the solid groups further apart than when the cobalt is sitting uh, over here. So it could be just a steric effect. 2.3 kcals is small. Uh, we ran the kinetics, it's again close to 24 or so kilocalories uh, per mole. This was done by Robin Padilla, who is now with Springer in New York. Uh, Rob, Robin also did uh, a crossover experiment to make sure that there's no dissociation while it hops. So it could be that rather than hopping down the line, it comes off and then it comes back on. And so for that, we labeled CP with methyl and the phenyl with deuterium, and then you run this back and forth, and the, the methyl CP never touches the deuterated ligand and uh, vice versa. So it's not coming off. So this is a very simple movement. It's the simplest one that you can think of in terms of loading up a molecule with sunlight to a high energy state. It just shifts up. I mean, if you think about uh, like a toboggan or something, you're shifting this up in terms of potential energy, and then it comes uh, back down. So how does the cobalt shuffle, as we call it? So for that, we started to uh, collaborate with Tom Albright, my old friend from the University of Houston, and a, a later Vince Gandon uh, from uh, Offset. Uh, and his, uh, initially, his student, Kami Olova, started these uh, calculations. She now started an assistant professorship in Lagos, in Nigeria. And indeed, it's going by the edge. Okay, so here's the ground state, the solid dot. Here's a transition state. The stars are transition states. So the ground state is shown here. Here's eta four cyclobutadiene complex. And when it goes up, it's eta two. So it's sitting on the edge. So it's coordinatively unsaturated. 
The calculated number for the parent is 27, observed 23, not bad, uh, for, the, for these initial calculations. And then, from this transition state, it parks in an intermediate, which is eta 4. That is, this double bond and that double bond is complex. This double bond is left unchanged. So this is sort of indicated here. Eta 4 for this position. And then it goes from left to right, so the symmetry equivalent other eta 4, through an eta 3 transition state, which is this uh, guy here. That eta 3 symmetrizes the molecule from left to right. And then it goes back eta 2 on to the uh, next species. And what is was interesting about this trajectory was that the eta 4 species lies in a well. That is, it's separated by the, from the adjacent transition state by quite a large barrier. And that suggested that perhaps one might be able to observe that using low temperature photochemistry. So here, uh, one Jérôme, Jérôme uh, uh, an undergraduate from France, uh, this was his major uh, contribution to my research efforts. He made this movie. Uh, and you can see how it's migrating through the edge. Okay? Eta 4, eta 2, and eta 4 intermediate, and uh, back and forth. So we did this for a whole bunch of systems here, the 3, 4, and 5 pentalanes. Uh, here it's the generate. Here, of course, you store energy at about 7.6 kcals for uh, linear 5, it's 9.7. Actually, when you calculate this, the longer the system is, the further it goes to the end, and the more energy uh, it stores. So the question was, can we see this low temperature intermediate species, eta 4, if we formalize at low temperature? It's a long shot, because we go into the excited state, and the hope was that perhaps it would then fall down into this intermediate species, by no means guaranteed. So we decided to do that. And first of all, we, uh, to, to begin with, we made a prediction, namely, if it's, uh, when you start with this starting material, everything is singlet, so let's just look at uh, the relevant ones, three singlets for the phenylene and a CP singlet, and let's ignore the TMS signals. Uh, when you go through an eta-4 intermediate, everything desymmetrizes. So you should see seven singlets, six for the phenylene and one for the CP. And even if it's doing the left-right equilibration through the eta-3 transition state, where this eta-4 turns into this eta-4, okay, you still should see four phenylene peaks and one new uh, CP uh, signal. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, on warming, this should go back to uh, where it came from. So we constructed some uh, fiber optics uh, setup with the NMR to irradiate the sample and the, and the cold in the NMR tube. And so we start with, I don't know whether you can see, but this is a deep orange for the starting material, and here's the UV. And when you photolyze it, indeed, it turns deep green. Okay. There's a new UV spectrum. And when you warm this up, it goes back to where it came from. And when you follow this by NMR, this looks a little busy, but it's actually quite simple. Uh, here's our starting material okay, that we formalized. And it's got three singlets indicated by these lines for these three uh, penylene peaks. And the CP <coughs> is here. There's a little bit of free ligand uh, in this uh, uh, sample. And when you formalize that, you go down here, minus uh, 65 actually, we formalized minus 65, started reporting at about minus 60. <coughs> all the starting material singlets are gone, well, almost gone. You barely see a little bit left. Here's the CP, a little bit left. Okay? And you see a new spectrum, which is highlighted in the orange uh, color. And what was startling was that the new spectrum showed only three singlets for the new phenylene and one new CP. And this was bizarre. Because the, if, the, if the intermediate was static, it should have given us six phenylene signals. And even if it's left-right equilibrating, it should have given us four signals. But we saw three. So there was some other functionality uh, uh, going on. And one of the possibilities, topologically at least, was that the cobalt was sitting in the middle, but it was moving up and down rapidly. 
while maintaining its left-right identity. Maybe as indicated here, it would sit to the left side of this benzene ring, go up and down, and that would give you three signals for the uh, uh, That was bizarre, because really, if it starts moving around this ring, it should have really be moving around all around, and that would completely symmetrize the system. We should have seen two signals for the family. There was another problem with this, namely, as you move up and down, uh, of course, you should go through an eta-2 transition state, which is exactly the eta-2 transition state that goes back to sacrobiodine. So this shouldn't be moving up and down and not go back to sacrobiodine. Yet, it seems to be doing this at minus 50. We even we cooled it all the way down to minus 100. We couldn't freeze it. So there's a very rapid up and down. Uh, whoops. Uh, uh, fluxionality. There was something else weird about this. Namely, when you look closely, particularly at the CP, uh, oh, I should say, of course, when you take this and then warm it up, it goes back to where it came from. So that was all clean. But as you follow this, you notice that there is a drift of the signal, particularly the CP, <coughs> from, uh, from this position over to, to the right, and then it disappears. And here's the new CP, uh, the, the, well, the old CP that reappears. This was actually known behavior in organometallic compounds. It indicates the presence of a thermally accessible triplet state, or a triplet itself. And you can tell the difference by a sort of Curie-like experiment where you plot the drift versus temperature. And if it's a straight line, it's a triplet. And if it's curved, it's a thermally equilibrated triplet. Uh, and it's curved because you're perturbing the equilibrium as you go up uh, in temperature. And we find in four cases where we measured this, it's curved. So we have a species in there that has a, a very easily accessible triplet. And it was very tempting to associate that triplet, of course, with this weird fluxionality, whatever the species was. Our guess was it was sitting somehow in the middle. And it's doing up-down equilibration, but not that right. Even weirder, C13. <coughs> of course, we did the C13 and the correlation spectroscopy and all this. Uh, and when we, we did this, we found that one benzene ring what, didn't show up. Oh, I should mention something else. Actually, I forgot. Uh, one of these singlets, there are two sharp singlets. One of these singlets is very broad. And the CP is also very broad. And we thought maybe it's because of this thermally accessible triplet. This is the broad line here, and the CP, everything attached to the cobalt is broad because of the thermally accessible triplet in a nutshell. So when we do the C13, this seems to uh, corroborate this because six peaks are missing, or one benzene ring is missing, presumably the one that's attached to the cobalt, and that's because of broad. And uh, these are these uh, dots here, assuming that we're sitting in the middle. Uh, and indeed, the CP C13 is very, very broad. It took us some time to actually detect it. It's almost buried in the baseline. And remember, the uh, CP uh, hydrogen in the previous spectrum is a broad right there. So the carbon is even more uh, broad. So looking at these numbers, there was one thing without going into great detail, that was weird. And that was this chemical shift, which we thought uh, of this carbon, which we thought was this carbon here. Uh, remember, this one we couldn't detect, and there's another one here that's reasonably normal for a phenylene. It's very high here. And that's very indicative of a carbon that's actually flanked by two sacrobiodine rings, namely this carbon. And this suggested that it's actually not sitting in the, in the middle, it's sitting at the terminal. It was the first time that this came up. Uh, this took us an embarrassingly long time. Yeah. We were fixated on the fact that it was sitting in the middle. We didn't even consider that it might be jumping actually all the way uh, to the end. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said that a scientist's greatness is measured by how long his or her wrong ideas set back progress in their field. And by that token, I'm definitely up there. So 
This had to be considered. If it's sitting over here, actually, then this chemical shift, 112.1 for this carbon, uh, would be uh, uh, perfectly fine. And there was another advantage of being at the end, namely, now we can be fluxional up and down, avoiding going through an either two transition state that would uh, move us here, and avoiding this uh, symmetrization uh, of the signals that one would expect if it's sitting in the middle. <clears throat> so we decided to do a labeling experiment. You can tell the difference, obviously, between these two by labeling, for example, the center ring with C plus T. And so we did that. Uh, and this was done by Vincent Reagan and Rima Dresa, uh, both of them were undergrads in my lab. Uh, Vincent uh, is now uh, finished his PhD in Amsterdam, and Rima is uh, just completing a PhD. Uh, you, you can take C13-benzene, tetraiodinate, do the solo gashira, you know, the usual synthesis, and then you cyclize and you make this. And so re to remind you, uh, on photolysis, it either is this or that. And if it's this, then the broad singlet that we assign to this hydrogen here should split into a big doublet, coupling constant 160 or something. Uh, if it's this, then that broad, uh, uh, th then it's the 6.45 sharp singlet that should split into a doublet, and the broad signal, which is now assigned to this hydrogen, should stay unchanged. And so we did that. Here's the original <laughs> experiment, uh, a reminder, here are the three singlets, here's the broad singlet here, and here's the sharp singlet at 6.45, and when we do this with C13, there's the big split, and the this guy stays totally unchanged. So indeed, it's jumping to the end. And this is general. Okay? They all do that. I'm just showing you linear four. Linear four jumps all the way to the terminal ring here. And this one is beautiful because as they get longer, you you know, like a bus, it, <coughs> it has stops as it goes from one from the higher uh, energy form to the lowest energy form. So you can see this jumping, and then uh, you warm it up slightly to uh, minus 30, minus uh, 20 degrees, and it jumps first to the, this ring, and then it keeps on going by the original uh, uh, cyclobiodine shuttle uh, over to the terminals. So there's the prospect that perhaps in a polymer system, which might, be, might have some applications in energy storage, uh, you start with a system like this, and it goes all the way, and it co-op just migrates all the way to the terminal ring, and then it starts hopping down the line. And this is extremely interested, interesting to people uh, in the electronics area, because they love uh, staged uh, isomerizations. And this is one of the simplest systems you can think of. There's uh, memory storage type uh, applications to a system like that, and so forth, apart from the uh, energy storage. <laughs> so, finally, is the thermally accessible triplet now responsible for this fluxionality? And indeed, it is. And to cut a long story short, this is the result of uh, high-level uh, DFT calculations with Mel Scandal and Tom Albright. Uh, what happens is you start here, and when you photolyze, it jumps to the terminals, <coughs> and here's the eta-4 species, which I'm indicating here also, as shown here. And uh, it has this energy, so it's 11 kcal uphill from the ground state. And then it has a very easily accessible uh, triplet, only 4 kcal up uh, in energy at this position. And there's a minimum energy crossing point between the single and the triplet, uh, which happens very readily in the CP cobalt system, uh, that allows it to cross over from single to triplet. So that explains why even at minus uh, uh, 90 or minus 100 degrees, we can't uh, freeze it up. And so here's a picture of it. This is the uh, intermediate triplet uh, that equilibrates up and down <coughs> and gives, you, gives rise to the three singlets, as indicated by the color scheme, that we observed in uh, uh, our original uh, experiment. So this intermission, this is the uh, story one. And uh, we just got this published. We actually got the cover and chemistry of this. And our paper got passed to all the referees here successfully. <laughs> <laughs> so here's two, a little shorter story. Um, 
And that is based on what we call formalin, the two cyclopent linked cyclopentadienes, the formalin diarotenium system. This one we made quite a number of years ago, and then we uh, did a photochemical experiment. This is yellow. When you photolyze it in a marsh sample, it turns colorless. So it photo bleaches. And without an X-ray structure, we wouldn't have been able to tell what it is. It's clearly isomerized. Uh, and here's the starting X-ray, and here's the product. And so what it is doing, it formally, when you form, and you can do this again on, with Californian sunlight, and I'm sure also with Asturian sunlight, <laughs> when, when it doesn't rain. Uh, and then you're formally cleaving this bond and that bond, and now you have another <coughs> topological change that is extremely simple. Rather than shoving up and down, as in the previous system, you rotate by 180 degrees. And we call this rotation loading up the spring. So this one we call a loaded spring. And then when you warm this, so this is stable, uh, you heat it up to 80, 100 degrees, and it pops back uh, to where uh, it came from. And this one is actually much more stable than the previous CP cobalt system, much more robust. This one is air, this guy is air stable. It has a melting point which is extraordinarily high melts without decomposition, very high for a metal carbonyl, uh, supplies and so forth. This one is also air stable and you can even do the reversal in the solid and in sublimes and so on. Uh, so we have a much more robust system than the previous one, the CP cobalt system is quite air sensitive. Uh, so we repeat that the cycle, it's quantitative, it's very, very clean. As long as you use a filter, so here's the UV spectrum of the starting material. This is 400, you probably can't see that, but it tails into the visible, that's why this is yellow. And you, when you shine light into this band, it photo bleaches it. And in order to avoid shining light into this band or that band of the product, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, causes decarbonylation, you use a filter. Initially, we use sodium nitrate. Trite, uh, aqueous sodium nitrite, which cuts off at 400 nanometers, and then we start buying commercial filters to filter off the light. So, as long as you irradiate above that, very clean. Uh, and uh, so, we repeated this uh, a number of times. Actually, I had a, a, a new undergraduate that joined my group, and I gave him the sample and said, Fertilize this as often as you can, can back and forth. So a week later, he uh, came back and said, I've done this 50 times now. Uh, I want another project. So, <laughs> so I got one. Uh, so it's very robust. So how much heat does it store? We can do this by differential scanning calorimetry, about 20 kcals uh, per mole. When you look at the calculations, uh, again, these were high-level calculations done with uh, Yosuke Kanai and uh, Rima Srinivasan. Yosuke is now an assistant professor University of North Carolina, he went back uh, to Bhopal at the institute there where he's an assistant professor. Uh, in collaboration, actually let me start a collaboration with a mechanical engineer, uh, Arun Majumdar, uh, who uh, was a, a professor in mechanical engineering in Berkeley. You may have heard of him. He, was, he then became energy czar with uh, Obama and the administration, then left the White House and uh, went to Google, step, step up, I guess. And uh, then, uh, and now he's a professor at Stanford. And uh, another student, Dusan uh, Koso. Calculated number, very good, 20.8, measured 19.8. They also looked at other systems, routinely seems to be best in terms of energy storage. So 20 kcals is stored. This is actually quite good. If you calculate this in terms of mechanical engineer's number, namely kilojoules per gram, uh, it's 0.19. The lithium battery is 0.5. So it approaches a lithium battery uh, energy storage. But it's heat, <coughs> not, not electricity. So what's the mechanism? The photo forward in presence of C13O, no label incorporation. It doesn't look like it's dissociating CO. One can do the photo forward in carbon tet in one molar or even in air. And this is important in one molar, as you'll see in a minute. The reason we did this experiment was because no mechanistically, initially, 
automatically you assume that when you fertilize a dinuclear system, the metal metal bond breaks. This is the energetically most plausible uh, scenario. It's the weakest bond and, and, and so on. And if this happens, you should get a ruthenium radical, 17 electron radical, which in carbon 10 should be trapped to make the chloride. Okay? And this is indeed what happens 100% in an old experiment done with the corresponding CP ruthenium dimer. This guy is exactly this compound minus this bond. This is an old Mark Wrighton experiment of the 70s. And he gets the chloride quantity. We run this with one molar content. Didn't do anything. Uh, we then looked at the, the light, what happens with lower energy light, because we st started seeing a different kind of reaction. Indeed, if you use UV light below 300, CO blows off. And you actually get this tetranuclear cluster. Uh, and it is deeply colored. So this is a dead giveaway. If your filter isn't proper, you start seeing color, and the, and the system is not stable. Uh, so you need to filter, uh, use the filter. Uh, deep purple compound we have next year. Quantum yield is quite good, 50%. <coughs> and the fault cycle is intramolecular. So we did the crossover experiment where we mixed D8 ligand with H8 ligand compound and there's no crossover. The reason we did that was because, remember, formally we're cleaving this bond and that bond doing the 180 degree turn. It's possible, in principle, and I, I leave it up to you to come up with a mechanism, that this dissociates, okay, and then rotates and it comes back together. Uh, and this seems to be ruling this out. And, of course, the kinetics are cleanly first order and so forth. Uh, which I, I'll come back to. So we did another experiment, which, was, I, which I love. Uh, this is my kind of experiment. Namely, asking a different question. Is it possible <coughs> that when uh, this photoisomerization occurs, the ruthenium's that are bound to the CP uh, go from one pi phase to the other? And the way you can test this is by making the CP a hand namely make it chiral. And you do this by adding a substituent. And then you can tell you know, whether the ruthenium is on one side uh, or the other. Uh, so uh, we stuck T-butyl on, uh, on both sides initially. And that's one diastereomer. And the same synthesis, you get the other diastereomer, where they're po pointing to this in the same direction. This one is actually chiral, called a TL. And this one is meso. It's got a little bit. So two diastereomers, and you fertilize this, and by the way, the x-ray structures on everything here in, in this project. Uh, and it uh, goes to this clean. So in this entire slide, notice what I've done is, in the rotation, I've left the right side static. It's the same. And I'm rotating left side. So when this rotates, this T-butyl, as it comes around, winds up pointing towards you. Polarized, thermally back, we did it for a few cycles. It's, it's clean, it's not isomerizing into <coughs> this isomer. And conversely, this isomer isomerizes this way, this diastereomer, and, and the two do not interconvert. So the key is that the, the cobalt stays on the same side of the CP. And there's another question you can ask, namely, is it possible that in this irradiation, the ruthenium's that are attached to the two CPs trade places somehow. And you can do this by labeling ruthenium and CP. So doubly label one CP with T-butyl, this ruthenium with phosphide. Phosphide the isomerization works fine. Uh, and you fertilize, and uh, uh, it uh, goes from here back, back and forth. Uh, the T-butyl doesn't wind up on this side, or this ruthenium doesn't trade places with this one. Uh, and the phosphides are, are stable. Uh, and there's another isomer one can make. That's how we know that these are stable in terms of phosphide position. And it stays put. So in other words, everything stays together. It looks like a 180 degree uh, turn. So we looked at the kinetics, clean the first order. Activation energy is 30 uh, kcals. From all, it's unchanged uh, from diagonal to decane. There doesn't seem to be any uh, uh, 
called polar Salman effect. And as I said, it tolerates one molar carbon 10. We did one more experiment to make absolutely sure that CO is not dissociating. And this was precipitated by the fact that the delta S for this particular uh, the parent is reasonably positive. Not positive enough to indicate CO dissociation, but it was positive enough that uh, we did another clever experiment, namely mix unlabeled ruthenium with labeled C13 over ruthenium and do this uh, uh, thermal reversal, and uh, there's no crossover. So, what are the possible mechanisms? Three come to mind. One is no mechanism. It's conserved. Uh, and so this would just rotate like uh, a pi 2s, pi 2a, 2 plus 2 cycle addition or something, or, or cyclobutane uh, isomerization, where you go through a tetrahedral type transition state, which I'm sort of trying to indicate here. So this was shot down very quickly by uh, DFT calculations. Uh, that calculate that this would be above 65 kcal per mole, and remember our measured activation barrier is 30, so that's no good. So there is a stepwise process where it's possible that we're breaking this CP ruthenium bond first, make this biradical, and then this bond migrates up, and that gives you that. Uh, this was shut down because uh, there are data in the literature that show that uh, a vinyl ruthenium, phenyl ruthenium, and so on bond is way stronger than 50 kilocalories per mole. Our activation energy is 30. That rules this one out. So then we were left with stepwise two, namely, indeed, uh, this guy, uh, when it goes back to uh, where it came from in the photo uh, isomerization, first makes a CPCD bond sort of like this in, in the least moment process, and then gives us a diuranical. And then this diuranical rotates and it reforms this. And initially we had ruled this out because in carbon tet, one molar, there's no trapping. And that seemed to be inconsistent. Uh, and uh, of course the assumption was all along based on literature data, we were fooled here also for a while, that this rotation would be very fast. So this would be the rate determining step, and then everything uh, is fast uh, after that. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, one would have thought that perhaps the routine would be trapped by content, which we didn't see with one more. So then we did the, the whole mechanism. And this was done by Jeff Grossman and, uh, and these two characters here that we Shown. Jeff was a professor in physics, then uh, moved to MIT. He's a star at MIT. And a big surprise. The surprise is that there is a pre equilibrium. And the rate determining step is actually rotation. So, indeed, this mechanism <coughs> seems to be operating. Initially, we make a CPCB bond by this transition state here, where this bond is broken. Uh, uh, sorry, this bond's broken and that bond's broken. And here's the new bond. And that gives us the anti-ruthenium biradical. But this guy, if you can form this, only has a four kilocalories per mole barrier to go back to this material here. So this is an extraordinarily low barrier for formally breaking what looks like one of the strongest bonds in the system. And it's facilitated by the fact that these two ruthenium's are 17 electrons. So it's going back and forth. And then every now and then it reaches this transition state, which is the rotation. And we uh, were fooled by assuming that this was relatively fast. It turns out that this ruthenium, of course, since it's a radical, there's a big d orbital with one electron in it that actually has uh, uh, quite a bit of trouble getting past this hydrogen here in the rotation. And so this becomes, therefore, the rate determining step. So from here, it's about 12 kcals to rotate. Overall, calculated activation energy from here to here is 29.7, experimentally 29.9. Pretty. And then we go here. And so this pre-equilibrium suggested that this should be trappable by carbon tet, and perhaps in the initial experiment with one molar carbon tet, our concentration of carbon tet wasn't high enough to 
for the bimolecular step of uh, trapping to be fast enough to compete with the unimolecular isomerization. And so if this is the case, then one should be able to increase the concentration of content. And there's a classic uh, saturation kinetics experiment that you can run where you just keep increasing at a high enough concentration of content. If it's starting to trap this, it goes off. <coughs> uh, it traps the system right at this stage. So this is how the picture and the rate determining step then becomes this. So with increasing content, the rate should increase and eventually it should saturate, should be constant and reflect this activation barrier here. And this is exactly what we see. So to show it again, here's our intermediate which normally would go by rotation to our uh, starting system. This is the bimolecular trapping step with one molar content that was too slow so we saw the kinetics that lead to here and here's the intermediate. When you increase the content concentration, you start trapping at this stage here. And so indeed, the rate goes up and then levels off to a saturation, saturated system. In the delta G, we get out this is about 25 kilocalories per mole. The delta H calculated is 22. So that's, that's pretty good. And this was done by Steve Meyer, uh, who now has a civil servant job in Oklahoma. So that explains the thermal reaction. What about the photostat? What's the mechanism of that? So now that we know the thermal manifold, we thought perhaps when we photo excite this, the excited <coughs> state falls into this antibiradical because we just found out that the antibiradical, once you have it, only has four kcal to drop into the forward uh, uh, photoisomer. So we started working on this. First of all, we found that the quantum yields are unaffected by the solvent more or less, very small effect. Uh, and so there's no funny polar, polar uh, business going on in the photo step. And more telling was that the photo step slows down with low, at lower temperature, such that at minus 65, actually, the photo isomerization is shut down. It doesn't go, even though it's obviously absorbing photons. And you can show that by other trapping experiments, which I won't go into. And this is shown here. As you decrease the temperature, the quantum yield, or in this case, percent conversion, goes down to almost zero. That indicates that after the excited state, it falls down into some kind of a species that has a thermal barrier to continue. So then we did a very, uh, what I call, sexy experiment. Namely, Lin Chen, uh, we contacted Lin Chen at uh, Northwestern, and uh, postdoc Mike Harvin, uh, who is now with spectrophysics. And she is an expert in what's called picosecond X-ray transient absorption spectroscopy. She can literally get, if you wish, an <laughs> X-ray picture of reactive intermediates, X, Y, Z data for reactive intermediates. And she was very intrigued by our system, and she said, we should formalize this and <coughs> see, see what we get. Uh, and so we gave her the tetra-t-butyl compound because she needed uh, higher concentrations. And what she does is she photolyzes with a probing pulse, uh, uh, with an initial pulse of laser 351, uh, and then after 100 picosecond delay, she puts a probing pulse, a pulse, an analytical pulse of X-ray, X-ray B. And indeed, she sees a new species. And that species gives us X-ray data, XYZ data, that show that the metal metal bond is broken. But the two ruthenians are still on the same side. The CPs are slightly twisted, but it's, you know, in my thumbs are the ruthenians, it's doing this in slight twist. But the two ruthenians are staying on the same side, exactly as we originally thought uh, might be the case. Photolysis should break the melanin bond initially. This seems to be what is happening. Then we got a hold of uh, Charles Harris, my colleague, and his students, particularly Song Guyen and Justin Loman, uh, who did picosecond infrared. Now we can look at CO stretches. And so they also took the T-butyl, and here we are our stretches that follow, and they shine uh, light on it to photo excite this, and then they, have, uh, they can vary the delay time from 1 to 1700 picoseconds, and then they use a probe pulse in the infrared. 
and you get a new infrared spectrum. And they find two species. One that is very short-lived, with uh, a CO date, a stretching data looking here, it reverts back to st uh, starting material at 30 picosecond rate, and the uh, calculated numbers indicate that this is a singlet sin by radical. So it breaks the bond, goes back, like this, very rapidly. More interestingly and crucially, there is a longer lived species that reverts back to starting material in nanoseconds, which is a triplet. <coughs> looks almost the same. And it's that triplet that is crucial based on calculation to continue on to photoisomer. So the final mechanistic nail here in this, in this coffin is, here's the thermal manifold again, starting material, you irradiate, it makes this. So when you irradiate, you go up, here's the singlet, that singlet goes back to where it came from, it's not productive, if you calculate this, it goes steadily uphill in energy. This doesn't go on. But the triplet is longer lived, and it has a crossing point with a thermal barrier of 10 K gels, exactly consistent with our temperature dependence, that uh, makes the crossover from triplet into the singlet manifold, which is the antiviradical. And then thermally, this rapidly. So we have, we now know exactly how this thing goes in both uh, directions. And so, the final couple of minutes, let me show you a device. So we decided to build a device. This was started by Kasper Mark Poulsen, who's a superb postdoc, and now uh, just started an assistant professorship at Chalmers University, uh, in conjunction with a chemical engineer, Rachel Siegelman, and You've seen him before, Arun and Dumdar, and do some also. So the idea is starting material one, photoisomer two, we have a chamber where we photolyze, convert, we measure, and, and we have a flow system. So conversion here, we measure how much conversion, and then we have a chamber here uh, that is one of these uh, engineering devices where you can measure uh, temperature rise in the thermal reversal. In other words, how much heat is re released. I always kept telling Casper, uh, we have to be able to heat a, a cup of espresso to be able to sell it. Uh, and then you go back and you just keep cycling. So for that, Casper had to make a very highly soluble material because we wanted to make as, have as high concentration as possible. Uh, and uh, so he stuck on some large grease large alkyl groups, and yeah, I won't go into that. So we, we get uh, the, uh, these, uh, uh, these substituted systems, they behave normally, polarize, go back, DSC, you find 23 kcal storage, and the crucial thing is that they're very soluble. Uh, this is in uh, THF, the uh, starting material, 400 mix per milliliter, the photoisomer, 300, and dichlorobenzene is even better, but we stuck with THF. In THF, you can calculate by these equations that at 350 mg per milliliter, you should see in the thermal reversal heat release step a temperature rise of up to 23 degrees. So that was good enough. So the, the final thing that we needed for the device was a catalyst. Because I didn't want to heat the sample to get back even more. And, and so this is like a year and a half work of work, two postdocs. Uh, eventually we found one, a uh, commercial silver nitrate on silica. We now make our own 1%, so lower percent. In the NMR, 30 megs, two minutes, boom, goes back. Very clean. Isolated 28 megs, but by NMR it's 100% clean. So here's our device. What you need to do is microfabricate some plates, which we did at the Lawrence Berkeley lab, where I'm a principal investigator in the uh, uh, microfabrication uh, lab, molecular foundry it's called. And then you have to have $30,000 to mimic the, the sun, <laughs> which is this lab here, it's a ridiculous, uh, but you have to pay that kind of money. Uh, and, uh, and here's our device as we are fertilizing. Here it is again, a little clearer. So there are these uh, channels, 
and you pump your starting material through here, and it goes through, and then you measure over here how much photoisomerization you have. In this experiment, we had 82% conversion, this concentration, at this pump speed. And so you slowly pump it through. And then at the other end, you let it go through the chamber here. It's a vacuum chamber that was quite an ingenious construction. I don't know anything about this. Mechanical engineers built this. And uh, you have, it goes through this tube, and you have uh, basically it, then it counters silica gel, silver nitrate and silica gel to catalyze the back formation. It releases heat, and you can measure how much heat it releases, and then you just collect it. So that's the end of that story. So this is the first time anybody's ever made a device like that. This is now patented, and we are dealing with some venture capitalists who are looking into commercial exploitations. Uh, so, you know, I, I prided myself for 40 years uh, in the fact that my research was uniquely unencumbered by potential utility. But now, as my son told me, uh, Papa, you're finally doing something useful. And I, guess, <laughs> I guess that's true. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> Good research is quite expensive, but as Bob Bergman, my colleague, told me, bad research is also very expensive. So, <laughs> can't win this one, but I'm grateful this was initiated by some seed grant from Berkeley, and then the NSF and particularly the Department of Energy uh, chimed in. And here I promised Eduardo and Jose uh, to show them the new bridge. This is the uh, new uh, Bay Bridge that leads from Berkeley, so this is a picture taken from, from the Berkeley campus. You look over to the city, city of San Francisco, and there's this Bay Bridge, uh, and the old one was not earthquake proof, and it fell down in 1989, and since then, they've been building this, or getting the money ready, so it's, it's now open, and it's really quite beautiful. The old one, they're still taking down, uh, and it goes through this island here, which is called uh, Yerba Buena, uh, and uh, then uh, it continues uh, all to the city over here. So here's the downtown uh, San Francisco. And here's a picture from, uh, from my house, actually, looking into the bay. Uh, Jose, feliz cumpleaños. You're not 75, you're just 18 with 57 years old. So keep on doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Wolfgang. Y a continuación, el Profesor Barruenga entregará la medalla conmemorativa de la segunda conferencia Barruenga 2010.